Sean, do we admit people who are in the waiting room right now? I've I've admitted everybody. Oh, okay. Yeah, everybody's in. Um, give another maybe another thirty seconds for people to join us, and then we'll uh, and then you can start here, man. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you had a restful night. I know that some of you are really early, like 7 a.m. <laughs> but those uh, who are here, I want to uh, acknowledge the land in which that you are all living. So feel free to use the chat uh, and share where you are located uh, as a way of uh, thinking about how this land has been providing a source of life and sustenance, how this land is also a symbol or reality of the broken relationships, and also the land where our indigenous siblings have been caring for and continue to help us to use well. So I would like to take a moment of let you write down where you are, if you know the territory of uh, those groups. And in case you don't know, uh, this is a, perhaps an opportunity for you to find it out um, where you are and, and uh, which indigenous communities um, that uh, that uh, traditionally and continue to live, um, live with uh, the rest of the settlers and new immigrants and so on. Wonderful. Thank you for participating. And it's also want to acknowledge of the diverse uh, communities that we are part of. Uh, cross cross uh, from Canada and now some of us joining from the US. Um, and uh, whether we are in this kind of group gathering, uh, it's, it's abundance of the diversities that uh, we, we really enjoy and, and uh, continue to thrive despite the challenges and the divisions and the barriers. So while you're continuing to chat, uh, write your chats, I also want to um, kind of free kind of you in terms of the breathing. It's still morning um, and, and uh, you know, where you are, I don't know, but uh, I am in Toronto um, and uh, it's just stunningly beautiful day. The just uh, clear blue sky uh, and uh, flowers are starting to bloom. Um, and, and the sense of gratitude and the sense of the new life, um, a season of spring and, and many of us celebrating Easter this time. So we give thanks to that. Uh, and hopefully we can just uh, give a three deep breath in and out on your own pace, okay? Thank you and welcome again. Um, so I was introduced yesterday, but I wasn't fully uh, present yesterday due to my uh, meetings. So my name is Heran Kim Craig, and I'm 
really honored to serve uh, Emmanuel College as principal and also uh, teach preaching. And uh, this uh, conference has been my passion and, and uh, my love. And so your presence and your participation, your leadership um, has been a real delight this year. So let me offer a uh, opening prayer. And uh, as a kind of background, I just learned this prayer uh, from um, a meeting that I attended yesterday at the TST uh, Senior Executive Council. And that prayer was offered and I thought it was good to share. So this is an Easter prayer of Saint Hippolytus. And I'll tell a little bit more about this saint. Let us pray. Christ is risen. The world below lies desolate. Christ is risen. The spirits of evil are fallen. Christ is risen. The angels of God are rejoicing. Christ is risen. The tombs of the dead are empty. Christ is risen indeed from the dead, the first of the sleepers. Glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. So those of you who don't know, I didn't know, so um, about this saint, Hippolytus, and apparently uh, he was the bishop of Rome and one of the most important second and third century Christian theologians. He wrote many, many, many books, and among his voluminous writings, um, the, and touched on a variety of subjects, but that embrace and include the exegesis and homiletics. So very fitting topics for our conference. And uh, one of his best works, and one of the first commentaries that we, we can find out is the commentary on the Song of Songs. Um, which was composed during uh, Easter, the season that we are celebrating. So, so interesting, isn't it? So Sean, if you don't mind um, sharing the screen of the poster. Yes, so um, I don't know whether you are pondering upon why this poster for this theme of the Rethinking Preaching Conference this year, the planning team had kind of fun and 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 uh, exploring how we can capture the very theme that we are talking about through the image such as this. And so this got chosen. Uh, and again, you know, the image does the beautiful job of interpreting. And uh, so I don't know how you read this image, um, but, uh, yeah, but it, it has a multiple, I think, meanings. And, and so as I was able to listen to the keynote speaker's address and uh, at the end, the plenary session, um, several themes, I thought, uh, were appearing and interweaving. And, and uh, thinking about this poster, so there is definitely a barrier, right? Almost like a no trespassing. And in some ways, that could be taken as a very positive because if we want to protect that the nature, that path um, for ecological reason, this is a really good thing, right? But, but if this path is leading to, as our theme says, toward healing, and because of these barriers that some of us cannot enter, then we need to remove those barriers. And so I was hearing those those uh, themes, and and um, and uh, the, the keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Deborah Mumford, really talking very deeply about uh, mental illness, wasn't it? And how that needs to be addressed in preaching. So I was thinking about I love word plays, um, and and so we are talking about illness, so that I word but to help to heal, to get better with those illness, 
there has to be several I that we need to have our as our resource and our, our tools. And one would be the sense of interdependence, that we are not independent. We are not perfect being, that we don't need others, whether you are able to uh, function well at this point, right? So there is a sense in which that we rely on, we depend on, sense of humility there. I also heard very strongly about integrity, that preacher has to have integrity, the congregation has to have integrity, despite all the um, discriminations and things that um, are challenging. And I heard so beautifully about Imago Dei, right? The, the, the image of God that we are all created. So to, to really wrestle with and, and uh, toward the healing, by removing those barriers uh, and crossing boundaries, we need to have those interdependence, integrity, and uh, you know, imago dei, living out that. Um, and uh, ultimately, that towards healing and and uh, and that uh, in a way, dealing with these issues are human rights issues, and dealing with this is about well-being and health, and so. I thought that was really uh, powerful, and I heard from several chat that it was a very, very moving and and uh, interesting conversation yesterday. So thank you again for your active participation, and equally, I'm very, very uh, looking forward to today. I could be more fully engaging today than yesterday, so I'm I'm looking forward to that. And so with that note, I'm gonna pass on to my mic to uh, head in. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim Craig. Um, my name is Haylem Yoon, and I am one of the supervisees of um, Dr. Heron Kim Craig. Um, and I'm working on my actual um, dissertation topic would be crossing boundary crossing preachers. So this conference is very meaningful for me. Um, so what I'm gonna do is um, we we have for preaching conference we have keynote preaching not just keynote speaking, but keynote preaching. And Reverend Dr. Sherry Genovo will be our keynote preacher. Um, but she gave me some scripture readings. So what we're gonna do is we're first gonna read the scripture readings and I'll give you some moment of silence. We'll reflect on the scripture in silence for like five minutes in total. We have three readings. Um, and then I'll um, introduce Dr. Reverend Dr. Sherry Genovo and then we'll have her keynote preaching, and then I'll respond. So I'll share screen um, for the scripture reading. Okay. So let me read it and I'll give you some time to reflect on it. So this is the first page. So first on this page, Galatians chapter three, verse 28. There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now continue on Matthew chapter 19, verse 12. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. So let us take some time to reflect on these two texts.
Herein is wisdom. And I'll go to the next page. So our third scripture reading is from Acts chapter 8, verses 27 to 40. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, the queen of the Ethi Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now again, let us take a moment in silence to reflect on this reading. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. So now I will introduce our um, keynote preacher, Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo. Um, Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo is an ordained United Church minister who performed Canada's first legalized same-sex marriage. She is currently the minister at Trinity St. Paul Center for Faith, Justice, and the Arts, Arts, and that's where I attend, so Sherry is my um, very own minister. Um, Sherry is a member of the Order of Canada, recognized for her contributions to provincial politics and for her lifelong advocacy for social justice. As the former member of provincial parliament for Parkdale High Park in Ontario, Sherry passed into law more pro-LGBTQ2 plus legislation than anyone in Canadian history. 
Thank you so much, um, Reverend Dr. Sherry Genovo. We're very happy to have you here and it's all yours now. Uh, thanks, Haley, and it's great to be here. Um, I first of all want to apologize for my voice. This is the first time that I've been able to speak in about five days. I've had laryngitis and been a bit sick. Uh, I, one friend said it's God's way of telling you to shut up. Um, but, you know, we don't often listen to her, we preachers. So here I am, and I'm happy to be here. I wanted to start off with a favorite quote of mine, and that's from Karl Barth. And now Karl Barth was described by none other than Pope Paul VI as being the most important theologian of the 20th century. Um, actually, another version of that quote says that he was the most important theologian since Thomas Aquinas. And Barth said that when a preacher preaches, they should have uh, in one hand the newspaper and in the other hand the Bible. So I wanted to start today with the newspaper. But kudos first to what I'm looking at behind me, and you are too, and that is this wonderful piece of art by our Harmonia Rosales. Uh, she, uh, of course, here shows us a different version of what we would call a divine or a deity. And um, I'm going to intersperse what I say with some images, not only of God, but also of Christ. Um, and again, Easter, Christ is risen, they have risen indeed. So newspaper, um, right now, as we speak, there are some 300 bills on the order paper in various United States. Some of them are passing into law as we speak. Some of them are about to be, um, God forbid. And uh, all of them restrict the rights of those who are gender diverse or trans folk. Uh, so that's happening south of the border. If we think we're better than that, we are not, because north of the border, three of our provinces now have enacted transphobic laws that target children. Yeah, children in schools. So often I speak to teachers groups. I was just the keynote at Ontario English Catholic Teachers, and I always start off by saying that I want to give them some spiritual armor because most of them are secular. Um, I know we're not, but uh, I thought that I would do a romp through the Bible and give us some spiritual armor too. So there's that. Uh, people ask me why I wear this piece of plastic around my neck, uh, because it has been known as being a symbol of the patriarchy and the power of the church back in the day. Um, the reason I wear it is partly because of that but also because when I was first ordained about 30 years ago and walking down Roncesville Avenue in Toronto's West End, a lovely old gentleman came up to me and said, good afternoon, Father. And I thought that was so gender bending. I loved it. That was 30 years ago. Uh, let's start as we should at Genesis. So Genesis, the very earliest form of Genesis has God creating male and female in God's image, male and female in God's image. So God is definitely not a he. God is a they. God is, from the inception of our scripture, trans or gender diverse. Um, now, often those who want to beat up on queer folk to SLGBTQ plus will quote the Bible. And that's why it's really important that we have spiritual armor so that we can speak back whoever we are to those quotes. And so I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to talk about a couple of the worst texts of terror, as we call them in the queer world. Um, the first being Leviticus, over 600 different strictures or rules in Leviticus, of which only one, I think maybe two, um, say that a man shouldn't sleep with a man as they do with a woman. Interestingly enough, nowhere in scripture does it say that a woman shouldn't sleep with a woman. So, hey, dykes, we're good. Um, but in Leviticus, why would we focus on that and ignore everything else? Uh, as I often say, uh, I don't see a lot of pickets outside of Red Lobster, so shellfish, also one of the rules. There's lots of rules in Leviticus, most of which would get you arrested, like sacrificing live animals. Uh, so again, proof texting, as you know, 
is what's happening there if people quote Leviticus at you. The worst, of course, in terms of misinterpretation is Sodom and Gomorrah. It was really interesting recently in our church because a gentleman who has been a queer activist in the city for longer than I have um, died. And before he died, he had some heads up. And I asked him, you know, Don, what scripture would you like me to preach on at your funeral? And he said, tell them about the real meaning of Sodom and Gomorrah. So an interpretation for sure. But I said at his funeral, it's probably the only first and only time I will ever preach about Sodom and Gomorrah at a queer funeral. What did I say? I said that actually Sodom and Gomorrah is a queer positive story. Now, what do I mean by that? The gist of the story is this. God sends two angels into a town to test their faithfulness, to test whether they are hospitable or not. The villagers' reaction to those two angels is to threaten them with gang rape. Think about that for a minute. Why not arrest them? Why not kill them? I don't know. Why rape? Um, it's a particular kind of sexual violence. What was it about these angels that you know provoked that kind of reaction? Um, so these angels are strange. They're weird. They're different. They walk into this village. The erstwhile sort of not really hero of the story, Lot, uh, says, no, 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 leave the angels alone. Take my virgin daughters and have your way with them. This same Lot, by the way, goes on later in the story to have incest with his daughters. So if this is a story about sexual morality, I think we should just take it out of our lectionary. I don't believe it is. I think the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is about difference and how we accept difference and how we welcome difference or not. But I don't want to dwell on the texts of terror. A lot has been said about them. I want to talk about the texts that are positive about queerness, particularly positive about gender diversity, particularly positive about trans gender and trans, if we can call it, formations. I wanna talk about that. So let's look at the very first named convert in the New Testament. Lots of conversions before that, but this is the first named one. Although of course they don't have a name. They are just called the eunuch. Now for Philip, who was a Christian Jew, to even touch a eunuch, to have anything to do with someone who had been probably castrated against their will so that they could serve in this royal household and be safe around the women, the harem. Um, for him to even touch this person would have been against their purity laws as a good Jew back then. But interestingly enough, it's not Philip who initiates this. It's the eunuch who initiates it by quoting scripture to Philip. And as the story progresses, it is the eunuch who asks to be baptized, not Philip who offers. So the very first convert in the New Testament is not only queer and gender diverse, but is also a person of color. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to switch over to another background here, and that is this one. So who is this a picture of? No. It's not a woman. This is the depiction of Jesus Christ, which is why at the very outset, when I talked about Easter and I said, Christ is risen, Christ is risen, 
instead of saying he, I said, they have risen indeed. It was extremely common in early art forms depicting Jesus to depict Jesus as gender diverse, as somewhere between male and female, to show that Jesus was unlike any other human being. And so I direct your attention to that wonderful, life-changing quote from Acts, Paul, of course, in Christ there is no male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's beautiful, right? And that is profoundly queer. It is profoundly trans and gender diverse focused, which I think is beautiful, of course. Um, and then, you know, I used to say, when I wrote my first book, Queer Evangelism, and second, The Queer Evangelist, I used to say, I think I said this in Queer Evangelism, which was my doctoral thesis, that Jesus said nothing about homosexuality. It was a common quote back then. But in fact, Jesus does say something about queerness, and in particular, trans and gender diverseness. Here in Matthew 19, 12, 2,000 years before Lady Gaga, Jesus says, some are born that way. Yep. Who knew? The reason we skip over, and the reason I didn't notice this in the early days of reading scripture again, reading scripture with queer eyes, is that it comes right after the proscription against divorce. Interesting, right? But listen to those words. Some are born that way. Now, what is he talking about? What are they talking about? I don't think they're talking about those who are born intersexed. I don't think Jesus took time to check out people's genitals. I think what Jesus is talking about here are those who are born not interested in heteronormativity, who are not interested in traditional marriage. And that's what he goes on to elaborate by saying some are that way because of heaven. I mean, how beautiful, how interesting, how completely queer centric and transcentric that is. Yet there it is hidden before our very eyes. So again, spiritual armor. So again, as we're beating up on kids, which we are, as we are prescribing, you know, and posting laws against those who are gender diverse, might we <laughs> quote this too? because this is in our scripture and it's out of the mouth of Jesus themselves, of Jesus themselves. Let's continue. I wanna show you something else, which is again, a very, very familiar picture to most. The Last Supper. Now, Dan Brown had a lot to say about The Last Supper. I'm going to move over here so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and, and one of the things that he had to say was that uh, the disciple sitting next to Jesus uh, might be Mary Magdalene. That, I think, is nonsense. Uh, it's very, very clear that in a patriarchy, in a patriarchal time, what we're looking at is a group of the disciples. And the one sitting next to Jesus is often described as John, the disciple that Jesus loved. Now we know historically that Leonardo da Vinci was homosexual, but I don't think that's why Leonardo painted it this way. I think again, the tradition of early artists 
was to show John, the disciple that Jesus loved, as feminine. And here you have a very clear depiction of that. And what is surprising to me is that all through history, we have been looking at this picture and we have not seen what's actually there. I mean, it's in our stained glass, in our churches, and yet look, that's John, the disciple that Jesus loved sitting next to Jesus, painted as a woman, painted as feminine. So we have in our faith, which I think is so fantastic, from the very beginnings, from Genesis on right through to Acts, many examples of the gender diversity and the fact that gender diversity is upheld. The fact that gender diversity is seen as a positive, that Jesus, Jesus self is depicted as gender diverse. Uh, and interestingly enough, this of course goes along with, you know, a lot of the reaction to the prudishness that developed over hundreds of years, to the misogyny that saw something wrong with being female at all. The misogyny that saw femininity as something negative, and the misogyny that sees gender diversity as something negative. The same misogyny that sees women earning still in our United Church of Canada less than men, or wearing a collar at the front of a church and preaching like men. So again, this comes out of a tradition which is problematic, but not biblical. And I think that's important because if it's gods against gays, gays gonna lose. But it's not God against gays. It's not scripture against queers. It's actually our queer scripture, which is beautiful, and which defines, I think, the growing church of the 21st century. I know in our congregation, one of our growing edges are 2SLGBTQ folk, young folk, who are coming in because they're escaping from toxic religiosity. And that's sad, but glad, because if your congregation and if your church is offering sanctuary to everyone, I say at the beginning of every sermon when I preach at Trinity St. Paul's, I say these words. I say, no matter what you believe, no matter what you do not believe, no matter what you have done, no matter what you have left undone, no matter who you are and no matter who you love, you are welcome here because that is not just the church of our denomination in the United Church of Canada, neither is it the church of this particular congregation, but this is the church of Christ. And in Christ's church, everyone, everyone is welcome. So in going forward, what I'd like to posit to you and to have you think about is how to see not only God differently, not only God as the divine, possibly of color, possibly female, but also to see Jesus as maybe a they, them, and to see the depictions and the stories that we have in our Bible that have been there since they were written, that are trans positive, queer positive, that give an entrance to those who are different, sexually diverse. Uh, and often I think that going forward, as politics turns to the right, as we see this backlash, not only against women with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, but the backlash against all that we've attained, particularly in this country, 
Uh, I mean, I've been honored to be part of many of those movements to ban conversion therapy. We did it first here in Ontario to add trans rights to the Ontario Human Rights Code, first of a major jurisdiction in North America. I like to think that rather than take those rights away, then backtrack, which is what is happening politically in North America and predictably around the world, is that we as Christians show a different way of being faithful, that we as Christians show the love of God for all, and particularly for the Anawim, as Matthew Fox would say, particularly for the oppressed. And quite frankly, the most oppressed right now in all of our societies are the gender diverse, particularly the gender diverse of color. The highest suicide attempt rate, the highest poverty rate, they're waiting for us. The only question is, will Jesus, the they, them, will the divine, the they, them, will the Holy Spirit, the they, them, not, as one of my theology professors said, two men and a bird, but they, them, gender diverse trinity, gender diverse faith. And so I'll just conclude by saying, Again, Christ is risen. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. They are risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, I would like us to sit in a little bit of silence for like 30 seconds to reflect on Sherry's sermons. Amen. Thanks be to God. And thank you so much again, Sherry. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for providing us with an eye-opening vision of progressive queer evangelist Christianity and for providing us with the spiritual armor um, to be the changer or, or the transformers of the misinterpretations of the scripture are very precious gender non-conforming scripture. Um, so first of all, Sherry is not a manuscript preacher. She just did that with bullet points. So I didn't know exactly what Sherry would preach until she did just now. So here is a very law, raw and unembellished response to Sherry's amazing sermon. Um, we, I think we so often associate evangelism to being conservative and even homophobic. But Sherry, your sermon challenges such assumption and misconception, and your sermon just now was a living proof that loudly declared that evangelism is in fact a radical proclamation of the good news that liberates everyone. So thank you so much for that. Um, your your um, piece about spiritual armor, um, I really appreciated that. Um, you not only dismantled the misinterpretation of the text, such as Sodom and Gomorrah, and gave us the tools to learn how to interpret it um, as it was almost meant to be, that it's about um, accepting difference. It's about difference and how we welcome difference was so eye-opening. Um, what I loved more was that you not only stopped there about dismantling the misinterpretations of such texts, but you uplifted the, the gender conforming and um, gender positive scriptures. And it was so powerful to see how you call God and even Jesus with the pronoun they. And I think I'll probably practice that um, as I I'll preach in my own life as a preacher as well. Um, 
I also want to, oh, may yes, I just say something, Hey Lynn? Um, mm -hmm. Just uh, uh, Deb, Deb Walker put in the, the chat a picture of Jesus on the cross wearing a skirt. And uh, I've actually seen that when I, I walk the Camino and that is in this beautiful cathedral in Burgos. So I wanted to, to point that out to people. Um, it actually was a sign of modesty, but it is interesting, right? That uh, it's a skirt, not a pair of pants and not even a loincloth, a skirt. Anyway, just wanted to say that. That's amazing. I also wanted to mention um, the, the power of using image in this sermon um, that you used it on your background even. So like you could move around and we could see different parts of the image and you gave us an alternative lens to look into these um, pictures or paintings that we've seen so many times yet never seen it through the queer lens. So um, it was a uh, an amazing tool to learn and have with us in in this sermon. Um, I also want to mention uh, Matthew nineteen, um, uh, chapter chapter nineteen, verse twelve. Um, I also never paid attention to this verse, also because of the same reason that it comes right after the divorce and what adultery is, what is not. So I I think I probably skipped it. I was so it was so eye opening to read this scripture when when you first gave it to me and I was like I never knew that there was a verse like this and it's just yeah it's definitely in my spiritual armor to um to resist against the hegemony of heteronormativity and queerphobic interpretations of the scripture um out of everything I think um, I really appreciated your breaking boundaries of um, using the scripture and also, or interpreting the scripture through the lens of queer, queer um, confirming or gender non-conforming um, lens and um, your use of pop culture, um, the social issues, easy to follow sermons. It was all thought provoking. And um, I think, it really challenged us and gave us the spiritual armor for sure to be the transformers of the society. So thank you so much, Sherry. Um, and I would now invite everyone else to, to engage with Sherry, to ask questions, to, um, to just share your comments. Maybe, maybe if I could start off, just thank you for all the comments in chat. Really interesting to read them. Um, thank you for all the amens. Uh, I, I, I just want to say, um, kind of on a political note, it's very interesting. The resistance against, um, you know, uh, bureaucratic, autocratic, dictatorial regimes has often come from the church. Not enough, I don't think, but often. And um, I'm, I'm thinking in particular of the resistance to, you know, and the fall of the Soviet Union where resistance happened in churches. I think as we see the rise of the right wing, uh, particularly where women, um, oppressed minorities, uh, people of color, uh, queer people um, rises in our midst, that churches can be that again, that we can really be the centers of resistance, real sanctuaries where people can be safe, where people can escape to, um, where people can be looked after. And so I think there's a historical calling now, particularly in North America, um, context in which we uh, live and move and have our, our being, but also in other countries and around the world. So just want to throw that out there. Thank you so much, Sherry. Let's see, I think we have questions from, question from Ian. There's one from Ian. Um, I find the use of they, them pronouns for God and Jesus really fascinating. Could you say a little bit more about that? How scholars have affirmed the gender diversity of Christ and God? Um, well, again, I think that we simply do not know the the gender of Jesus. I mean, we we can assume biologically he was born male, but that's not really gender the way we understand it today. So we don't know. Um, we don't know how Jesus defined Jesus' self, right? 
Um, we assume a he because of patriarchal times, because of, of the writing that we're seeing, but just because that's the body you're born in doesn't mean that's the gender you are. So I think that's true of everyone. Um, not just Jesus. And I think we assume gen gender and the whole use of pronouns. The reason that, you know, I have she, her is um, a way of identifying ourselves, but also a way of showing solidarity with those whose pronouns don't necessarily match the body that they are in or the gender that they were presumably assigned at birth. So, so I think it's a way of opening up the conversation to look at spiritual leaders in particular, to look at Jesus, who we say, um, Emmanuel, um, God with us, um, different from regular humans in that regard. Uh, and also, if Jesus is God with us, then God we know from the oldest version of Genesis is they, them. It says it right there. Even Adam, actually, in the oldest version, Adamo, the original Hebrew, was earthling. It wasn't really sexed. The newer version of Genesis has that in. But um, God, for sure, creates male and female in God's image. God is gender diverse. So why wouldn't God with us, Emmanuel, also be gender diverse? I mean, to me, it's a logical argument. It's just logic, not to mention the way that Jesus has been depicted throughout history which I think is also buttresses that. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else with any questions? This is a, an amazing opportunity to um, ask Sherry, Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo some questions or have your own perspectives with Queer Lens share. Well, just let me say that it's just, it's a lot of fun and it's an honor to um, speak to you. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm so used to speaking to teachers these days um, in various guises and, and actually to other organizations about these issues. But it's fun to just flat out be Christian in a in a Christian surrounding. So uh, and to um, and to share with colleagues and those who are in Christ is wonderful. So one of the interesting things I think people sometimes find about me is how freaking orthodox I really am, theologically speaking. <laughs> I don't see any contradiction, which is why I love speaking to people that have different opinions, more on the Christian right, if you will than myself, because I don't think we disagree about the major tenets of our faith. I just think that we're disagreeing about scripture itself and how to read it. And I think that's the work of theology. So thank you for being active theologians with me. And thank you, Hey Lim, for um, being you, um, this uh, wonderful preacher, you know, in her own right. So thank you for hosting. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, I think we have um, a question or a comment from Jen, Jen Brown. Um, yes, good morning. Um, I just actually would like to make a, a kind of a comment because I'm still taking it all in and digesting it and um, yeah, mind blown about the whole they, them. Um, but I am just new to ministry. So I was just recognized May, 2022. And I grew up Catholic. So <laughs> this is like, <laughs> um, and the congregation I serve is Grace United Church in Hanover. And we just became an affirming congregation this past October. So lots of really positive ways forward. But I just wanted to, to say to Reverend Dr. Sherry that I really appreciated not only the visual images, because uh, as a former teacher, it's nice to hit all the all the uh, the learning styles, but also just the the clear passion that you have, but also the um, compassion and kindness in which you speak about those who maybe aren't as enlightened or those who 
um, have used scripture as a weapon to to oppress, to harm people. And I just wanted to commend you on that because that that is a difficult thing to do. So I appreciate I appreciated every moment of your speaking and am very inspired to continue digging and learning and and growing as well in this area. So thank you. Thank you, Jen, and welcome to the best job in the world. Thanks. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it's so important that we speak across boundaries. I think it's a problem on the left that we, and the problem generally that we speak in our own little echo chambers and we speak to people of like minds. It's really important. And that's to speak across boundaries um, and respectfully, right? To be able to listen to what someone else has to say and to agree and then agree to disagree, right? Um, so, I mean, that's, that's in fact part of the problem, I think, of the split, you know, in our, in our politics. So um, we're in a unique position to do that in congregations. Um, and I think that's a great gift of the job. I'm looking at, uh, hi, Jeff. I'm looking at Jeff Dale's, um, uh, you know, point here. I'm keenly interested in the intersection of scripture and realities of today. How might we explore preaching beyond our walls? Well, absolutely. Um, I mean, I spent a lot of my time doing that. And so I really highly advise uh, to, um, to get out there and to talk to people. You, it's interesting um, how things have changed. Even when I was in politics, and this is going back some years, uh, I remember going to a secular high school, public school, who uh, had politicians in for their civics classes, grade 10, so 15 year olds. And I always would say to the kids, what do you want me to talk about? I'm your representative uh, in government. And uh, in this one school, downtown Toronto, the first question was, why do our teachers say it's okay to be gay? And this was a school with pride posters on the walls. I mean, this wasn't dark ages. This is like maybe 2016. Um, and my EA, who you know was a columnist for our gay newspaper here in Toronto, was standing at the back of the room and was turning green. Um, I ended up in this classroom with Muslim and Christian students quoting chapter and verse. That's what I ended up doing. And that seems to me to be the call upon us in the world we're in right now, is that we are able to quote chapter and verse, is that we are able to in, engage theologically. Um, it's so important. And we all share similar, you know, Muslim, Jew, Christian people of the book, we all share these similar passages. So it's really important to unpack them. Uh, and I always say children's lives are at stake here. That's, that's how serious this is. A uh, highest rate of suicide uh, among teen kids is queer kids. So um, to Jeff's point, it couldn't be more important right now. Speak uh, wherever you can get a chance to speak, schools, teachers, other organizations, please, please do it. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, we, we have reached the time limit. Um, again, thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo. There are some questions on the chat or comments. We can um, have a time to unpack that again at the end of um, at the workshops from 3 to 4 p.m. So hopefully we'll be able to get to see you again that at that time, Sherry? Yes. Yes, okay. I'll be back. Oh, perfect. So we'll have more time to chat and let's have a, was it 15 minute break? Sean, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yes. And yeah, that's that's correct. Yes. Thank you both, Sherry, uh, Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo and Halen. Thank you so much for, for this morning. And yes, go grab yourself coffee, your tea, bathroom break, and, and then join your workshop at 10 15 uh, sorry 11 15 we'll see you back then thank you so much for everybody for joining us